Hello, Knights of Fulcrum, and welcome again to a wet Thursday audiobook here on Fulcrum Entertainment. It is, of course, Star Wars Red Harvest, the prequel to the fantastic Star Wars horror novel Death Troopers by Joe Schreiber. This is also by Joe Schreiber and is turning out to be quite a fun read already. If you're looking for the first part of this audiobook or want to check out our other audiobooks, go into the description where you'll find links to all our playlists. And if you haven't yet, subscribe, join the Order of the Fulcrum Knights, and leave a like on this video so that we can get bumped up in that YouTube algorithm and more people can share the story. There have been so many of you amazing folks commenting since last week. It's been fantastic. I love this comment from our good friend Matches Malone, who says, I'm afraid to love again. I'm not strong enough. It's okay, Matches. If something happens to this one, we'll make it through together. Don't you worry. There have been so many of you cool folks commenting since last week, and so many of you have come from Death Troopers. It's fantastic to see. Old Dirty Brett is here saying, appreciate all the content you're making. Absolutely love your channel. Thank you, Old Dirty Brett. Guys, go check out his uh, Twitch stream. He has free Wi-Fi and donuts. Is it donuts? Have I got that right, Brett? Twitch.tv forward slash Old Dirty Brett, I think. And there's Dry Ones One, who just said I just came from Death Trooper series, and that's how I found y'all. We have TGM, who says, Yo, I've been waiting for this. We have Benjamin Crane, who also says, Thank God, I was waiting for this to come out. We have Skylar Honnett. Hell yes, you got me hooked with Death Troopers, and I've been hoping you'd do the prequel. Isaac Iglesias says, heck yeah, finally Red Harvest, been looking for an audio to listen, this is gonna be good. And R. Renz DN says, dude, this channel listened. I asked for the series about halfway through the Death Trooper one. I do think I remember that. Although plenty of people were asking for Red Harvest when we did Death Troopers. I'll try and get round a few more of those comments, but we have to get on with the serious business of reading. So please, let us advance to chapter 5. Pain pipe. Master, I am ready to begin again. Seventeen-year-old Manar Rat stood in the center of the Academy's combat simulator, the one the students called the Pain Pipe, wiping the blood from his split and swollen lip. He felt no pain now, only a burning desire to attack and avenge what had been done to him. The fact that the damage had been inflicted by an automatic system as part of his training didn't matter at all to Rat. He was angry, and his anger made him strong. Up above, Sith Commander Master Zat Hraken sat back inside the control booth, one hand resting on the wraparound suite of controls. Though he was human, Hraken was built more like an aquilish, bald, bulky, and broad across the shoulders, his wide, olive-skinned face pinched into a perpetual scowl like stapled bundles of oiled suede. The hour was late, and he and Rat were the only ones in the simulator. Hraken, like Blade Master Shuck Weth, had been teaching here at the academy for decades, and he had seen students like Rat come and go, acolytes who seemed to require little or no sleep who insisted on continuing their training late into the night, sometimes into the morning. And he'd seen how it caught up with them in the end. After a moment's consideration, he tapped the intercom. That's enough for tonight, Hraken said. No! Rat glowered up at him with red and baleful eyes. I want to go again! Hraken rose from behind the control deck and stepped forward so that the apprentice could see him through the transparasteel window. You defy me? No, master. Rat's tone was only slightly modified, a symbolic obeisance to the master's authority. I only wish to train under the same regimen as Lance Lusk. Hraken nodded to himself. He'd expected as much. From the moment he'd arrived here, Lusk had set the pace for the Academy's most driven pupils, all of whom wanted to fight, train, and study as intensively as he did. What none of them seemed to understand was that there could be only one Lusk, and those who challenged him found themselves sharing the fate of Nicta.
among others. Still, Master Hraken had to admit that he found Rat's ambition intriguing. Rat was easily the smallest in his class, wispy-haired and fine-featured, and two years of training hadn't added more than a few ounces of muscle to his spindly frame. But he had deep steel in him, a kind of gritty, semi-psychotic rage, and a will to power that drove him to do whatever was necessary to get ahead. He also had some very peculiar ideas. It was Rat, after all, who had started the rumours that Darth Scabrus himself was abducting students and taking them up to the tower in an effort to find one powerful enough to succeed him. He'd argued the case so successfully that some of the students, and even a few of the masters, wondered if he might be right. Now, Hraken wondered if he had finally grasped Rat's ultimate goal. He touched the intercom again. All right then, once more. Without so much as a nod of acknowledgement, Rat dropped back into fighting stance, shoulders squared, jaw set. It was as if he'd known all along that the master would acquiesce. All right then, Hraken thought. Let's see how good you really are. He tapped in a sequence of commands and watched the simulator come to life below him. An automated series of heavy swinging arms arced out from either side, each one of them two metres wide, closing in so that Rat had to jump to avoid being crushed. He dived between them easily before going into a tuck and roll, successfully dodging the third obstacle, a spring-loaded picador pike, five metres long that thrust itself unexpectedly downward from the ceiling. Hraken nodded again. It had been the pike that had caught Rat last time. Now he was faster. Are you fast enough, though? That's the question, isn't it? How about when you can't see? Picking a pair of thermal lenses from the counter beside him, Hraken adjusted them over his eyes, then reached over and switched off the lights. Darkness swallowed the room, vast and total. Hraken flicked on the goggles, his vision helioscoped into a hundred brilliant variations of fluorescent green, before resolving itself into focus, and he leaned forward with keen interest. Down below, the now blind Rat stopped in his tracks, processing what had just happened and in that second the wall behind him burst open in a whistling array of heavy rubber whips slashing into the air. Rat jerked forward, but it was too late. The whips drove him to his knees. Kraken saw the apprentice's face clench, his lips drawn back in pain. It's over, he thought, and reached to switch the lights back on. But it wasn't. Rat was on his feet again instantly, jumping clear of the whips. Hraken immediately realised that the apprentice was no longer hampered by vision, or lack thereof. Now he was relying entirely upon the force. When the swing arm came down again, Rat reached up, grabbed it, and actually held on, a move that the Sith Master hadn't seen before, even from Lusk, riding it all the way up to the ceiling. At the apex of its arc, he let go, twisting and launching himself headlong through open space to catch hold of the spring-loaded rod as it came spiking out of the wall. It was a move of unprecedented grace and absolute precision. Rat spun himself around the rod once, twice, three times, building speed, and fired himself directly at the window of the control booth. Master Hraken jerked backward. Rat slammed into the transparasteel with both hands, actually clinging there for a split second, long enough for Hraken to see the student's face staring in at him. Then he dropped. Hraken whipped off the goggles and turned on the lights. Light roared across the room, filling every corner. He saw Rat standing down below his face flushed, 
shining with sweat, shoulders rising and falling with the effort of catching his breath. Despite his obvious exhaustion, the apprentice's face was almost incandescent with leftover adrenaline. When he saw Hraken coming down the stairs, his eyes filled with expectation, awaiting the Sith Master's judgment. Interesting, Hraken said. Tomorrow we'll see if you could do it again. Rat blinked at him. Master? Hraken looked around. What is it? Lusk, in combat simulation, is he ever? The Sith Master waited for Rat to finish the sentence, but in the end, the apprentice simply nodded and looked away. Tomorrow, he said. Walking back to the dorm, with his cloak drawn up over his shoulders and his wounds throbbing in the frigid night air, Rat stopped and glanced back at the simulation bunker. He was aware of what the other students and masters said about him, how he was too small, too weak, enthralled to his own paranoid delusions, and he didn't care. Tonight, he'd shown Hraken what he was capable of. Soon, the rest would see. He stepped over a high snowdrift that had formed outside the library, making his way around the eastern wall of the building until he found himself in the shadow of the tower. It was snowing steadily, but Rod could still make out the tracks leading up to the tower's main entryway, two sets of prints along with the familiar tracks of the HK droid. Rat felt the requisite twinge of jealousy. The tracks in the snow meant that Lord Scabrus had brought visitors here very recently. The Sith Lord had invited them into his sanctum, and they had stepped inside. Rat, who had never been inside the tower and could only imagine its secrets, wondered who the visitors had been. Lusk? Nicta? One of the masters? Slipping off his glove, Rat placed one bare hand directly on the closed hatchway, imagining for a moment that he could feel the power pulsating out from inside. Power that he would do anything to possess. Someday he thought. I'll go through there myself. Until then, he would keep practicing. And that's the end of chapter five. So last week I asked a bit about this whole thing being a Sith Academy and when the rule of two came in and loads of wonderful people came in to educate me. Thank you so much. Uh, Matt Curtis here says, Sith Academies would create Sith warriors for armies fighting the Jedi Order. Darth Bane ended the tradition with the rule of two, putting the Sith into hiding. Joe S. the Seventh adds to that, saying, This book is set 3,400-ish years before the Battle of Yavin. And uh, this is about 200 years after the Great Sith Empire got spanked. And he says that Darth Bane, who came in and put in the Rule of Two, was about a thousand years before the Battle of Yavin. So, I guess we have another 2,000 years, give or take, from this book, until we only get two Sith per go. Thanks very much, guys. And thanks to everyone else who uh, gave me a hand on that, which includes Darth Gamer, and uh, so did uh, James Andrews as well. Thank you very much. Now let's move on to chapter six, which is very short and entitled Hot Ships. It was after midnight in the Academy's main hangar. Finishing up the last of his maintenance chores, Pergus Frode found himself glancing at the Corellian cruiser, still taking up space in the corner of the landing pad. He'd refueled the craft and kept its engines hot, as its pilot had demanded. But that had been several hours ago, and there'd been no word from the bounty hunters. Now it was late, and he wanted nothing more than to shut things down, go back to his quarters, and collapse into his bunk. With a sigh, he went back to the hangar's control booth and sealed the hatch behind him. At least it was warm in here, a haven away from the wind. When he'd first taken over the job almost ten standard years earlier, Frode had retrofitted the booth to meet his needs, installing a personal thermal convection unit for hot meals, along with a data pad for his favourite hollow books and hollow mags. 
As a hired hand, he had no force powers and no particular allegiance to the Sith, per se. He'd only encountered Darth Scabrous on a handful of occasions, but the last and only time that he'd ignored orders to stay up and wait, he'd spent a week in lockup icing a broken jaw. Settling back with a reheated cup of Javarican espresso and a well-worn hollow of hot ships, Frode saw something flicker past the booth. He sat up and wiped a hole in the steamed-up glass, peering out. The HK was standing there, its photoreceptors focused in on him. Frode stood up and opened the hatch. Hey! The HK turned and looked back at him. Query, what is it, sir? How much longer are those guys going to be in the tower? Frode pointed at the cruiser. I mean, there's ships just sitting there, eating our fuel. Response, I suppose you ought to shut it down. But that guy Dronok said, Statement, he won't be coming back, sir. He or his partner. Frode blinked. What? You mean like, ever? Response, that is my understanding, sir. Yes. Pushing back his mission cap to scratch his head, Frode turned his attention speculatively back to the bounty hunter's vessel. You know, he remarked casually, a ship like that's got to carry a pretty sophisticated flight computer. Statement. I'm sure I wouldn't know anything about that, sir. The equipment of such vessels is not part of my programming, and you don't think Lord Scabrous would mind if I yanked her out, do you? The HK regarded him blankly. You know, set it aside. Scrap market value on that thing's not too shabby. Statement. I'm sure you could help yourself the droid said, with bottomless indifference, already turning away to go about its business. Settling his cap back on his head, Frode nodded and got his tools, whistling a little under his breath as he did so. Maybe, he thought, tonight would turn out well after all. And there... That's chapter six. That's all you get from there. So I'm just going to read out one little comment that I quite liked, which is left by Daniel House, who says, Hope you can do the whole book. Haven't found a full version of this book. Also, couldn't help but think of one of the Oktoberfest movie Germans in your bounty hunter voice. Ah, oh, yeah, so that was when I was playing as uh, whatever his name was, Dankus or something. Yes, yeah, that guy. I think it's all the snow in this book, you know? I wanted him to be one of those smug, ski-movie kind of villains, you know? Like the bad guys out of Cool Runnings. But let's not waste time. Here is Chapter 7, Martha. No, not Superman's mum. Martha, with an F. Hestizo Trace rolled over, drew in a deep, resigned breath, and lifted her head from the pillow. The small, nondescript sleeping chamber where she'd awakened had already begun to fill with soft artificial light. Although she was all alone here, she could feel the orchid waiting for her down below, some two hundred metres away, but close enough to hear its voice quite clearly in her mind. Hastazo! Emergency! She sat up, pushing off her covers. What is it? What's wrong? My intubation chamber, come quickly! Realising now what the voice must be referring to, she relaxed back down. Oh. Oh? Alarm flashed through the flower's tone. This is serious! I'll be down in a second. Harold, please! Okay. She told it. All right, hold on to your petals. I'll be down there in a minute. The orchid retreated in her mind, only marginally placated, as if still awaiting a formal apology. Honestly, Zoe didn't mind its presence in her thoughts. The bond that they shared was, after all, part of her identity. A Jedi in the agricultural core, 
one of the talented handful whose psychic green thumb kept her here in the nurseries and labs of the Martha facility. Martha was a hothouse. Its varying atmospheres, temperatures and moisture levels all carefully maintained to foster the widest variety of interstellar fauna in this part of the core worlds. But it was the Force sensitivity of Zoe and her fellow Jedi that drove the different species to their fullest potential. At 25, Zoe understood that there was innate value, even a kind of nobility in such things, nurturing every form of botanical life and encouraging every facet of its development and exploration. Rousing herself fully from the last lingering vestiges of sleep, she slipped into her robe and headed up the corridor to the refresher. The faint sense of unease followed her, an unwelcome remnant of some other unremembered dream. She dressed for the day, choosing her lab frock and hood from a rack of identical uniforms attributing the tinge of restlessness to that same nameless malaise that sometimes waited for her upon awakening here on Martha. Opting out of breakfast, she followed the concourse up to Beta Level 7. Martha's planetary status was constantly shifting with the position of solar activity and galactic cloud patterns. But, B7 was currently the busiest and most vibrant of the various cultivation and growth bays honeycombing Martha's surface. Usually, most of her fellow Jedi could be found there in the mornings, starting their day with de facto meetings to update one another on progress and research, and share their immediate plans for the future. The turbo lift doors opened on an eye-watering expanse of green and Zoe stopped there as she always did, letting the great familiar cloud of humid warmth wash over her. The smells of countless different plants competed for her attention, sap, fruit and flower mingling in a mind-boggling banquet of fragrances. Tilting her head back, she looked up on 150 standard metres of high-ceilinged vines and dangling root systems. All around were narrow, self-sustaining forests of succulents and subspecies, and high trellises overrun with loops and walls of growth so varied in colour and size that only through sheer day-after-day -day familiarity was she able to process it all. She could already feel them. Her mind tuned instantly to the internal hum of hundreds of different vegetative life forces, each vibrating according to its own particular emotion. Some low and oscillating, others pulsing high and bright to match the explosions of flowers that sprang from their stems. Many of the plants were local enough that she recognised their greetings in her mind as she passed by. Zoe walked among them allowing their rustling enthusiasm of leaves and stalks to distract her from the nagging tug of unease that had followed her up from below. Good morning, Hestizo. Wall Bennis was the first actual voice she'd heard this morning. A tall, soft-spoken man with calm brown eyes. The Jedi Aglab director was waiting for her behind the thick red stalks of a Malpaso tree with an extra cup of calf. Sleep well? Until the orchid woke me. Bennis handed her the cup. Any idea what's going on? I've got a pretty good guess. You do? Mm-hmm. Well, that's good, then. He went distractedly back to his own work, and then seemed to remember something. Oh, and so... When you get a minute, would you mind taking a look at the Pulsiferian moss colonies on B2? There seems to be some kind of secondary parasite growing in the soil. You always save the glamorous stuff for me. You're the only one who can understand it. The moss or the parasite? Both, I think. I'll take a look. She carried the calf across B7 until she reached the private incubation chamber in the far corner of the room. Deactivating the airlock, she stepped inside, resealing the door behind her. Foul! The orchid burst out. What took you so long?
You're not the only plant on this level. She took her time checking the temperature and moisture readouts on the wall unit, making incremental adjustments to both, and then walked over to the only plant in the chamber, a small orchid with black petals and a thin green stalk. Its fronds seemed almost to quiver with impatience. For a moment, she stood sipping calf and looking at it. I was cold during the night, exceedingly unpleasant. Actually, I turned the temperature down in your incubation chamber, she told it, almost a full two degrees on purpose. Well, I've been telling you for ages that you're a lot heartier than you thought. Now you know it's true. Fact is, you could probably survive a 20 degree temperature drop, maybe more, and you would have been just fine. That's cruel to test without warning. If I'd told you, Zoe replied, then you would have gotten yourself all worked up over nothing. The orchid withdrew into sulky silence. As Flora went, it was one of the most force sensitive species in the galaxy. The problem was, that it knew it. Zoe put up with it anyway, and most of the time she was happy to dedicate herself to studying its abilities and providing for its needs. Every so often, though, it needed to be reminded why it had endured for thousands of years. It was far more durable than it gave itself credit for. Zoe, the orchid said now, what is it? Something's wrong. What now? Outside, something's happening. Zoe reopened the incubator's hatchway and stepped back out. Standing motionless in front of the chamber, she realized several things simultaneously. First, that the initial sense of wrongness she'd been experiencing up until now had nothing to do with her work here on Marfa. Contrary to what she'd initially supposed, the feeling was emanating from an outside source. An interloper. Something that clearly didn't belong here. It hadn't been a dream. It was an alarm. And, second, despite the silence, she wasn't alone. So, the orchid's voice asked, What is it? Give me a second. She listened to the entire greenhouse with her ears instead of her mind. She heard no audible voices, but that was to be expected. Her fellow Jedi often worked for hours among their individual species without speaking a word. Much of their daily routine was accomplished in absolute silence. Pausing halfway down a long aisle overgrown with leafy stalks, Zoe looked up. Far overhead, she found what she was looking for. An 800-year-old panopticon willow, a perfect specimen of organic surveillance, draping its limbs in a dense canopy of emerald dripping lace. Each bud was tipped with a tiny golden eye. Zoe placed one palm flat against the shaggy trunk, allowing its root strength to pulse through her aware at the same time that the tree was embracing her as an equal. She felt her ground-level perspective surging up through its branches, spreading out along the colonies of sharply focused eyes. Her vision shifted, wobbled, and became clear again. She was now gazing down at herself and the entire floor from far above, from the willow's point of view. The tree's branches shifted, and Zoe felt a slight shimmer of cognitive dissonance as her perspective aligned itself, and she saw the familiar robed figure of Wall Bennis leaning face first against the sinuous, downy tufted trunk of a Malpassian squid pine. But Bennis wasn't leaning. He was slouched forward, motionless, his torso hanging at an unnatural angle, arms dangling at his sides, impaled by the spear that had been slammed through his back into the trunk of the tree. A long, dagger-shaped bloodstain ran from between his shoulder blades down his back, soaking through his belt. 
The cup of calf he'd been holding lay on the floor between his feet. Zoe realized that she could see Bennis's face. It hung ashen and slack, a dangling meat mask from which all life had fled. His blood spilled down the spear's rough-hewn shaft, and Zoe watched with the willow's unblinking acuity as a droplet formed at the end, grew heavy, and fell into the already congealing pool on the floor by his feet. Plip. Something rustled behind her in the leaves. Spinning around, her consciousness dropping back from the willow's branches into her own optic and auditory nerves, Zoe realised too late that she'd let her guard down. On the other side of the tree, somewhere just inside the thick green canopy, the rustling grew louder, closer. A branch snapped. Twigs crackled, trampled underfoot. Zoe felt the presence of this new thing, whatever it was, making its way directly toward her, no longer bothering to be quiet or stealthy. Fear took hold of her, vacuuming the air from her lungs. The buzz of plant emotion had fallen quiet, even the orchid was still, and the entire research level felt far larger and more desolate than it had just moments before. Glancing around, hearing only the faint click of her own throat, she suddenly wanted more than anything to run, but she was no longer sure in which direction to go. The noises she'd heard on the other side of the tree now seemed impossibly, to be closing in from all sides. She felt helpless, isolated, alone, except for the buzzing, weightless swarm of her own terror. A shape burst out of the green into full view, two metres tall. The bulky, fur-shrouded torso stood well above her. The long, squinting face was inhuman, cheekbones and brow jutted forward, a pair of stained tusks pushed upward from the lower jaw. The eyes that glinted from beneath its forehead were shining and intent. It was a wyfid, Zoe realised, the biggest she'd ever seen. Somewhere in his chest he gave a thick, grunting sound that might have expressed anything from appreciation to disinterest. Zoe turned and fled. She had taken three steps when an arm the size of a load-bearing girder slammed sideways into her skull, spraying bright fragments of pain through the right side of her head. Her vision shattered into a wide field of star-rattled blindness. When the blindness cleared, she was on the floor, neck deep in pain. Looking up at the wifid, the underside of one horned foot plunging down to smother her face. She could smell him now, his pungent and claustrophobic inducing stench like mildew and death. This time, it occurred to her that the death she smelled might be her own. Pressure engulfed her skull, squeezing agonizingly as the mottled flesh of his foot covered her nose and mouth. A vacuum of fetid, smelling blackness sealed tight. Muffled from far away, she heard his voice for the first time. The Orchid. Zoe squirmed and felt the weight lift ever so slightly to allow her to answer. What? The Murakami Orchid. The voice from within, the broad, tusked mouth, was low and hoarse, more of a growl. Where is it? Why? The eyes narrowed. Don't waste my time, Jedi, or you'll end up a corpse like your friend. He leaned down until she could actually feel the fetid stench of his breath seething through the slits of her nostrils. Where is it? It's in the primary incubation cultivator. Zoe sat up just enough to nod to the left and felt a bright sliver of spun glass shoot through her brachial plexus where the wife it had pressed his weight. 
Over there. Behind you. But you can't just... Show me. Grabbing her arm, he dragged her behind him. Zoe caught a glimpse of the longbow and the quiver of arrows strapped across the muscled hump of his back, the tangles of its grey, golden mane swinging back and forth. Small bones, some decidedly humanoid, mandibles and phalanges, were tied and braided into the end of his hair where they clicked against one another. Wyfids, if she remembered her taxonomy right, were born predators. They lived to hunt and kill. Those venturing from their homeworld found good work as mercenaries and bounty hunters, or worse. The wife had swung her forward by the neck and slammed her against the door of the incubator. Open it. You just have to push the airlock. Shoving her aside, he kept his right hand around her neck while his left hand gripped the latch and disabled the lock. The door opened and he pulled her in, keeping her at arm's length while groping around the incubator. Zoe tried to tilt her head upward to take the pressure off her throat, but he was holding her almost half a metre off the floor. She couldn't touch even with her tiptoes. From the far corner, she heard an explosion of electronic components bursting apart. Something heavy toppled over and crashed to the ground. When the wife's hand came back, his fingers were wrapped around the orchid's stalk, the flower already beginning to wilt in his grasp. What's wrong with it? the wife had asked. It's special, Zoe managed. It can't survive out of the incubator. It needs... What? he demanded, relaxing his grip just enough that she could finally slide down and touch the floor. She forced the word, hating herself for it. Me? What? If it's out of the incubator, I can't be more than a metre away from it. I need to be close, or else it'll lose its powers. Zoe looked out of the incubator, back in the direction from which she'd come. Her gaze flashed across the lab floor to the body of Wall Bennis. No longer pinned to the tree, his corpse lay in a crumpled heap, one palm open as if grasping for some final, unavailable lifeline that had failed to appear. The spear that had impaled him against the tree had been yanked free. Zoe had just enough time to wonder when the wife had pulled it out, when she saw the butt end of it flying downward toward her face, slamming her in the right temple and plunging her deep into a wide and starless night. That is the end of chapter 7. So, okay, everyone out there, have I been pronouncing that wrong? I went and tried to find a pronunciation. The only one I found was some dude saying, Wifid, so that's the best you're getting. Is it Wifid? Is it Whiphid? Is, is it something else? Give me a shout in the comments. Also, I kind of apologise for the orchid's voice. I kind of don't. I wasn't too sure where it was going to go, but the orchid seems annoying, so it seems like that voice is appropriate for it. I'm thinking about stupid voices. Emmy, uh, who commented and said, Oh, hell yeah, I'm almost done with Death Troopers, and I will start this bad boy ASAP. I hope you start this uh, book soon and you enjoy it. And it says, Side note, I anticipate the day we hear your Jar Jar voice readings, and oh, oh dear, now that would be something. Are there are there any books even featuring Jar Jar? Like, does he is he a lead character? Or is, is he even mentioned in any books? I could I wouldn't be surprised if like people who wrote books are like no, I refuse because all authors are snooty Frenchmen. Um, I refuse to put this Jar Jar in my book. No. And hello to Mr. Moxie, who says, Greetings to one and all. I'm so excited that you chose to read Red Harvest. Your voice work is outstanding. Hail to the Fulcrum Knights. Hail. Aurelian Carnoy, thank you very much for joining us, and has said, The quality of your audiobooks is amazing. I can taste the delight in your voice. Thank you so much. I am so glad to hear that. That's a lovely description of that. Thank you very much. Now let us continue to Chapter 8, entitled Polyskin. Throughout its history, the rocky desert world of Geonosis had suffered its share of catastrophes and mass extinctions, 
including the rogue comet strike on its largest moon that had very nearly wiped out the planet's entire population. Taking into account the resulting debris field, the flash floods and the random solar radiation storms, it wasn't difficult to see why the ancient Geonosians, what remained of them, had moved underground. Not much had changed since then. Standing here amid the caverns and rock spires of whatever remained, Rojo Trace realised that the Republic officer in front of him had finished talking. Or had at least paused for breath. The officer's name was Lieutenant Norch, and despite the fact that he was staring Trace directly in the eye and almost shouting to be heard above the wind, he still managed to sound both officious and insincere in his delivery. In other words, a perfect product of the bureaucracy to which he'd sworn allegiance. Furthermore, Norch continued, on behalf of the Republic's military and security divisions, we appreciate the order's timely response. The lieutenant gestured to the huge polyskin tent spread out in front of them, half a kilometre of rippling silver micropore flapping and popping in the wind like the sail of a ship going nowhere. Given the nature of our discovery out here, I'm sure you understand the urgency of our request. Trace nodded, wincing a little at the grit that blew into his face. He was a dark-haired man of unremarkable build and complexion, tall and steady and vaguely handsome in a way that didn't draw attention to the unshaven jawline, the green eyes and the faintly smiling lips. Yet, for every moment that he stood motionless outside the tent, perhaps listening, perhaps not, a sense of intensity seemed to gather around him, a sense of acute psychological awareness of its own rarefied state. We've got the initial report of it last night, Norch said, raising his voice even louder over the baked dry wind. Independent long-range hauler on its way through the outer rim picked up on an unfamiliar heat signature. They thought it was a distress signal, but when they landed, they saw this. And with a gesture no doubt intended to be dramatic, he turned to the tent and flung back the flap, allowing Trace inside. Trace ducked under the polyskin, glad to be out of the wind, and stopped, looking down. The crater was still smoking but he could see the wreckage piled up inside, perhaps 100 metres down, where it had punched a hole and permanently altered the landscape. Peering down into it, he was aware of the lieutenant watching him intently, with a sense of barely reserved judgement, until he was no longer able to contain himself. Well? Norch asked. What do you make of it? It's a Sith starship, obviously. The five engine pods, the boxy design. With all due respect, you mistake my meaning. We're aware that it's a Sith warship. We saw our share of them in the sacking of Coruscant. And then, puffing inside his uniform, the question is what caused it to crash here on Geonosis, and whether its arrival here ought to be considered an act of deliberate aggression. Why would you assume that? Trace asked. Norch narrowed his eyes as if reassessing the Jedi Knight's trustworthiness. The Republic has been evaluating this planet as a possible defense stronghold in the Arcanist sector. That's strictly confidential, of course. And? And when I contacted the Jedi Council, they informed me that you were in possession of certain telemetric abilities that might clarify our enemy's underlying intent. That's true. Well, in any case, now Norch was giving him the full scowl, out of impatience or the simple exertion of shouting over the flapping tent. Trace couldn't be sure. At last the lieutenant cleared his throat and found some speck out of the horizon to stare at. It was my personal understanding that upon arriving here you would use your uh, particular abilities to assist us in our investigation. And it was my understanding, Trace said. 
that I would be given complete authority here to perform my investigation without any outside interference. He was still looking down into the great smoking hole at the warship and the colossal planetary bullet wound that its impact had created. It was even deeper than he'd initially suspected, and he could already hear the subtle, lethal whisper of escaping pressure. What exactly do you want from me? Trace looked up at him. Get your men and clear out. From the tent? From the planet? One eyebrow arched up, a trick the lieutenant had been saving until now. I beg your pardon? It's not safe. We've already reinforced the ground around the site for a kilometer in every direction. Well, I'm not talking about the ground. Trace allowed his voice to become slightly sharper. Do you hear that hissing sound? The warship struck a subterranean gas deposit, a big one by the sound of it, and the underground gases here on Geonosis are notoriously unstable. If it sublimates while your men are around, you won't have men any more. Listen here, I'm in charge and... Then you'll do well to listen to what this man says. A new voice cut in. Trace turned to see a female Republic officer, perhaps in her early thirties, dark-haired and attractive, smiling at him. From Norch's salute, she clearly outranked him, but she didn't even acknowledge the response. Rojo Trace, I'm Captain Tekla Ansgar. Welcome. Her pale blue eyes glimmered at him, sharp and confident. It's a pleasure to meet you. I certainly hope you won't judge your experience here on the basis of one unpleasant conversation. Frankly, Trace said, my own experience here couldn't matter less. I'm here to do a job. Oh, I'm sure there's more to it than that. She stepped toward him, casually brushing his arm with her own. I have to confess, I've always admired the Jedi Order, but I've never had the opportunity to get to know a Jedi Knight personally. I'm afraid that's not going to happen today, Trace said. She frowned a little. But, before she could continue, Trace moved past her, turned, and jumped straight into the crater. The plunge took the better part of thirty seconds, but to Trace it seemed both instantaneous and, in an unreal way, much longer. Shearing downward through the chasm, he summoned the Force, generating a cushion of resistance beneath him until he felt his freefall slackening. The crater walls slowing down, individual molecules meshing to buffet his descent. Now, with a little bit of concentration, he could see every crack and divot in the rock as he passed. By the time he noticed the rest of the warship lodged at the bottom of the pit, he decreased his rate of descent to the point where he could reach out and catch hold of the broken fuselage. Cold, Durasteel slapped his hands. Swinging his legs around, Trace dropped through a ragged gash in the hull, boots thumping off a narrow band of twisted metal that had once been part of a catwalk. He took a deep breath and looked around. Even from here, the warship was a predictably ugly thing inelegant and utilitarian, the work of a culture that saw nothing of beauty in the galaxy. The impact of the crash had actually improved its aesthetics, giving it some makeshift degree of originality. Standing here, he could feel the hulking weight of the craft tipping unsteadily around him, the wreckage still settling, rocking into place. Sharp edges rasped and scraped against the deep, sedimentary layers, carving random glyphs into the soft sandstone. Beneath it all, omnipresent and lethal, was the stealthy whoosh of escaping gas. He didn't have much time. Edging his way deeper into the vessel, bulkheads shifting even as he passed through, Trace paused, expanding his senses to draw in any indication of any remaining life aboard. There was nothing. Up above in the tent, the military officer had told him that the initial bioscan had come back negative. 
though he feared that a handful of Sith survivors might somehow be jamming the reading, preparing an ambush. Trace could have told him already that was not going to happen, but he'd come this far. A simple curiosity drew him onward. Dropping farther, taking his time, he clambered through the main flight deck and groped in the dark until his fingers brushed against something smooth, damp, and still faintly warm. There was a soft, organic pulpiness to it. Without needing to look, he knew he'd come across the first corpse. Slowly, his eyes began to adjust. The remains of the Sith flight crew lay smashed and bleeding, burnt, skin bubbling over exposed bone and melted into the fabric of their uniforms. Fire and impact had fused several of the bodies into a single, twisted mass of faces and broken limbs embedded into the seats where they died. He could smell the gas now, its sulfuric, rotten egg fumes trickling into his lungs, and knew time was short. He closed his eyes again, but didn't remove his hand from the mass of dripping flesh and bone. Proximity was important. Physical contact was even better. Beneath the inner geometry of his own thoughts, he began to hear the curses of the crew as the ship's navigational system failed. Felt their dawning horror as they realised the engine pods were going to bury them deep below the planet's crust. In the end, the impending inevitability of death had reduced them to something as brainless and scurrying as Mustafar lava fleas, their faith in the dark side, their sworn oath to the Sith Lords with their incantations and ancient sigils, stripped away in a final spasm of animal panic. And then silence. Always silence. Trace exhaled, Reminded now of other terms he'd heard used to describe the Republic's role in crash sites like this. The officers might call them investigators, but the enlisted men on the ground had other names. Names like corpse counters and dirt tourists. The nicknames meant little to him. That was the job. Everything else was a distraction, including female officers who wanted to get to know him personally. He was aware of his reputation for being cold and impersonal. It didn't bother him in the least. He withdrew his hand, preparing his ascent to the surface, and sucked in a quick breath between his teeth, the bright lancet of sudden overwhelming fear that he'd just experienced had nothing to do with the warship or the remains of its crew. Something else was happening. Something far distant. Something far worse. He saw his sister's face. There could be no doubt about it. It was Zoe, and she was screaming in a frenzy of pain and helplessness. And although Trace couldn't see her attacker clearly, he realised from the erratic sunbursts of her thoughts that she had no defence against the thing that loomed above her, dragging her out of the Jedi Agricultural Corps facility, toward... What? He stopped. Frozen his current locale utterly forgotten, blindsided by a storm of disjointed images, the shaft of a spear dripping with blood, a flash of green, a whiff of something rancid and feral. His nostrils burned with the stench of a place that had been bottled up too long, a place of death and solitude and agonised last breaths. He could feel her confusion and apprehension pumping through his own circulatory system as if they shared the same heart. For a moment, he could feel the presence of her abductor. Listen to me, Trace told him. I don't know who you are, but I am in possession of a very special set of skills. If you bring my sister back right now unharmed, then I'll let you go. But if you don't, I promise you I will track you down. I will find you and I will make you pay. Of course, there was no response. From beneath him came a stuttering, squealing lurch, then a deafening crash as the fuselage of the crashed Sith warship swayed under his feet and abruptly gave way in a waterfall of sparks. There was a sudden whoosh and a plume of flame as a gas pocket blasted open from the wall. 
The explosion rocked the crater to its depths. Snapping around, Trace felt huge slabs of scorched rock scaling loose, tumbling down toward him. On reflex, he threw up a solid bubble of air, pressing it outward to ensure enough breathable oxygen. Too little, and he'd suffocate inside here, a bug in a jar. The bubble did its job. Debris hammered down on top of it, shale bouncing and skittering across the dome. Trace scarcely noticed. He cast his thoughts back towards Zoe, back to the place in himself where he'd seen and felt the final compulsive timpani of her distress, straining for any hint of where she might be, where her captor was taking her. But there was nothing there now. Only dead air, as deep and final as that which followed the crash of the warship where he now stood. And awful silence. Rising upward with the bubble, Trace made for the surface of the crater. The light from above, growing brighter, broadening to illuminate the deep frown etched onto his face. And with that out-of-nowhere taken reference, we end chapter eight. What? what? Do you know what? Do you know what? I, honest to God, thought of doing a Northern Irish, like, Qui-Gon Jinn accent for this dude. I was like, maybe we should try and pull out a Liam Neeson. And I was like, nah, 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 nah. And he ended up just being, like, fancy English again, like Obi-Wan is. But I, I should have. So I'd listen to me. I don't know who you are, but I'm in possession of a very special set of skills. If you bring my sister back right now, unharmed, then I'll let you go. But if you don't, I promise you, I will track you down, I will find you, and I will make you pay. See, would have been great, wouldn't it? But, ah, well, the decisions we make. Ah, before we get into the last chapter of the video, let's ha say hi to some comments. So the String Stalker says, best old Ben Kenobi voice ever. Bit off topic, but just came to me. Well, thanks very much, String Stalker. Uh, doing the uh, Ewan McGregor Obi-Wan's been really fun. Uh, TJ Templar, the man himself, says, thank you for the kind words, Sir Harry. Thank you very much for all your support, TJ. I really appreciate it. Griefer Games says, love your videos. I've been watching for a while now. I like to listen when I'm going to bed. And uh, says, may I suggest the rise and fall of Darth Vader? Well, we will put it on the list for our consideration. Thank you very much. And lastly, Michael Mobs. Great choice. Only just joined up and binged the whole of Death Troopers. Also a good choice. Keep it up, and if you're ever not sure what book to read, you can never go wrong with Drew Carpishan? Carpishan? Carpishan. Carpishan. Drew Carpishan. Is that how it's said? I don't know. I have been in this cupboard recording for too long, so let's go to Chapter 9, Myro Core. No, I don't know what that means, guys, I'm sorry. Zo awoke, staring into the empty sockets of a skull. Not human. It was a misshapen thing, one eye hole appreciably larger than the other, and a third gaping just above it. Its gap-toothed grin seemed to welcome her into some murderous new realm where proportions were a joke and nothing made sense. There was a dusky blue sapphire, probably fake, embedded in the thing's one remaining incisor. The skull's current owner had strung several lengths of thick cable through its facial sinuses so that it dangled like a grotesque bead on a string. And when Zoe sat up and tried to move away from it, the fullness of the chamber where she'd awakened came into view. She was inside a kind of trophy room. The cable ran from one side of the room to the other. Rows of similar skulls hung on either end. Dozens of them. Grouped together in clusters while others were set apart in twos and threes to create a kind of ghastly abacus. Beneath it, an irregular array of vats and stained crucibles bubbled steadily over heating elements. In them, Zoe saw more bones and shanks of raw, knobbled limbs protruding upward. Some sheathed in yellow fat and sinew, while others seemed to have boiled down to the marrow. Moss and mildew covered the ceiling, years of lichen and mould, colonies of life competing for airborne fat molecules coming off the pots. The smell of scalded viscera hung permanently in the air. 
swallowing, trying not to gag. Zoe squirmed again and felt something slick and oily brush against the backs of her arms. Turning around, she saw that the entire wall behind her was lined with skins and hides, each one crawling with layers of tiny, blind beetles industrially gnawing away. She watched, helpless, as they burrowed in and out of the hanging flank, hauling off chunks of greying flesh. Musky scarabs, a voice behind her said. Zoe snapped back around and saw the wifed standing in the doorway. His gaze was intense, corrosive, as if he could already see through her skin to the skeleton she would inevitably leave behind. Bones he might boil out of her if she weren't worth waiting for the natural decay process to do it first. Zoe moved her head slightly and winced at the pain in the base of her neck. She remembered those last few moments of the Marfa facility, the butt end of the wifed spear, a glassy rocket of agony, the blurry slither of the corridor as it warped past the lens of her ever-dimming consciousness. And just before she'd blacked out, the hatchway. Zoe looked past the wifed, regarding her surroundings through this new, unwelcome perspective. The whine of turbines under the floorboards, the persistent shiver of the bulkhead through the room was without any sort of viewport, offering no sight of their greater surroundings. She realised they had to be in flight. Is this your ship? The wife had nodded once. The Myrocar. Where are we going? This time, he didn't answer. Lumbering instead over to the nearest of the pots, she watched as he lifted the lid and dipped in with an oxidised pair of tongs, hoisting a grubby clump of something that she realised was a type of shank. Bits of gristle and musculature, a part of a leg, dangled from its lower edges. With an unimpressed grunt, the wifed dropped the part back into the pot and slapped the lid back down then turned to walk out again. Wait, she said hoarsely. The bounty hunter didn't stop. The hatch slid shut. A moment after he left, Zoe found the orchid. It was still inside the half-crushed specimen flask, strapped almost haphazardly between a cargo panel and a swing bin above the vats of limbs and skulls. Her captor had used the same greasy cable he'd strung through the skulls to tie the containment vessel into place. From where she stood below it, she saw that the orchid had flourished even while she'd lain here unconscious. Simple physical proximity seemed enough to keep it alive, despite the fact that for a good bit of the time she'd been out cold. Zoe looked at it. Hello? Nothing. It's me. Can you hear me? The initial process of communication was never easy. At first, it had felt almost unnatural. Yet, with practice, through countless mornings spent sitting alone with the orchid, she'd soon reached a level of mastery that eased the transitory awkwardness into a smoother and more organic leap. Are you there? Within its glass vessel, the plant finally twitched, brightening slightly in recognition of her presence. Zoe watched its dust-coloured stem inclining toward her like a beckoning finger. At the same time, she felt its life essence stirring within her, filling an almost physical void directly behind her breastbone and between her lungs, a place she thought of almost colloquially as her soul. She heard the first coarse whispers of its voice, gender-neutral, incoherent at first, and then becoming clearer, like a foreigner adapting to the nuances of an entirely new language. Zo, so, what happened? Are we well? Zo gave a rueful smile, felt the lump on the back of her head. I wouldn't exactly say that. The orchid was silent for a moment. Then, a sense that things have changed. You can say that again, 
she murmured aloud. Rupert? We've been abducted, Zoe told it. Taken. Another silence. Then. Thus, that is true. By this creature. Talk. Her eyes darted back up to it. That's his name? The Wyford? Yes, he's a... Uh... Hunting for the correct phrase. What is it, this word, one who takes people for money? A bounty hunter, Zoe said, and felt the orchid nodding in agreement. Yes, solitary, a bloodthirsty species, and aggressive. Zoe waited, processing the comment. The orchid had a gift for understatement, and she couldn't help but wonder about the criteria for this assessment. And a flower collected to boot, she told it. If the orchid had an opinion on this, it didn't voice it. What does he want? she asked. The orchid stayed silent. Staring at it, Zoe began to realise how her fully weakened presence had already affected the trophy room's biosphere. The naturally occurring moss on the ship's ceiling had started spreading at a noticeably accelerated rate, sprawling to swallow up the exposed bolts and seams in the interior walls. There was some kind of switchplate just above her head, with a sign written in another language, the wifeid's mother tongue, she assumed. But it was already so moss-covered that you couldn't make out the letters. Scraps of green rot within the skulls had begun extending their first tendrils up as well, reaching outward through eye sockets and trepanned holes. Simply by being here, she jump-started the growth of the Myraclaw's incidental flora. Do you know at least where he's taking us? Again, no immediate reply from the orchid. Zoe wondered if she'd reached the outer limits of the flower's knowledge. Then, she felt the spacecraft jerk hard to one side, the nearly subsonic whine of the turbine pitch-shifting into afterburner mode, and realised she was about to get the answer for herself. What's going on? Are we crashing? she asked. Going down, the orchid said. Where? Silence again. Then, the worst place in the galaxy. And with that annoying voice, we come to the end of chapter 9 and the end of our video. Thank you very much for joining me, guys. It just remains for me to say goodbye to a couple of people in the comments. Brandon B. Gamer says, Wow, you all did it again. A book I had no idea existed. Thanks again for a great book. As a Mandalorian fan, this is the way. And hey there, Tony Vlashen, who says, I never read Death Troopers, so I'm very much looking forward to the prequel. I am enjoying seeing this further into the story. It's quite interesting. And I'm really enjoying uh, hanging out in the uh, pre-Clone Wars, real back-in-the-past Star Wars stuff. This is a lot of fun for me. So I hope you will all join me again next week for part three of Star Wars Red Harvest. I'll look forward to seeing you then. Until then, though, please make sure you subscribe to the channel and you've become a member of the Fulcrum Knights. And uh, if you enjoyed the video, give it a like. It helps us in all that YouTube algorithm stuff. Make sure that when you subscribe, you hit that bell icon so you know when we are putting up videos and when we do our live streams every Sunday. Uh, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2.30 p.m. Uh, yeah, 2.30 p.m. Mountain and 1.30 p.m. Pacific, 9.30 if you're in the UK. Okay, guys, nothing's left for me but to say we are all fulcrum.